Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. I am the host of The Long Road Show, and I welcome, welcome you to our very first show. It is often said that life is a long, winding road full of bumps and turns, and no one gets very far alone. Everyone needs help along the way. I have had a lot of help on my road of life, and hopefully I can repay that help by paying it forward. This is not going to be an unusual show. I will not be your usual host. I am a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel with extensive training in and experience as an engineer and a logistician. As an engineer, I know there are certain rules that you can't break unless you want a disaster. As a logistician, I know that you have to make decisions based on what's available, not what you hope to have available or you risk disaster. I have a classical liberal arts ed social science education, so <clears throat> I understand that everything is an interconnected system, so I do not prejudge anything. I will not make up my mind and then look for the facts to prove me right. This show is about providing information, allowing you, the viewer, to make more informed decisions. I don't think for anybody. I don't make decisions for anybody. I trust an informed public will make the right decision far more than not. If you expect me to be bashing people, you will be disappointed. The Long Road Show will touch a wide range of subjects. We will go out in the field for on-site filming and interviews. We will have an email address for you to ask questions for pri of prior shows along with questions for upcoming events, or even viewers' comments and constructive criticism for improvement. Sorry, I have to admit, the long road is not going to be run live. We will have a blog to answer questions and provide in additional information. We will have a section depending on how long the interview lasts and where we will address the rest of the story or the whole truth. Too many times people are told part of the truth and they naturally assume it's the complete truth. So now I would like to welcome and introduce you to our first guest, Bill Gurney, um, Code Superintendent of the SAU 29. It and what we're going to do is part of our first interview was on site at the new middle school yes. construction project. And I think we have about an 18 minute um, film where we did the interview right on site. Yes, we, uh, you and I met with Bill Sudsbury, our uh, clerk of the works and toured the site. It was pretty exciting with the machinery going and uh, people working and we're right on schedule as far as we know to complete next summer. I was really impressed by Bill. Bill I view as, as an engineer as one of the most important people 
on the construction site. It's his job to ensure that everything goes to spec on time so we don't have to redo anything or spend any extra money. He represents the Keene residents on that site. That's his role. Okay, so hopefully now people will enjoy the film as it goes. Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Um, I would like to welcome you to the first episode of The Long Road Show. Um, we're standing here now, what's going to be the new gymnasium of the Keene Middle School, and I would like to introduce you to two of my guests, the Click of the Works. Say hello. Good morning. Good morning. State your name, please. Bill today. Sudsbury, Clerk of the Works for the Keene Middle School Project. He is the most important person. His job is to ensure that everything goes correct. And um, hey, Chris. good morning. Here's Bill Gurney, co-superintendent for the Keene, um, <clears throat> Keene School District. Good morning. And um, he's been here with, since the beginning of, the, yes, of this since project. We, since we broke ground uh, in March, late March, early April. When do we expect to get it finished, have the first students in? August 2011, we'll be moving in. August 2011. Um, as a um, clerk of the works, one of the things that people at Keene are really proud about is environmental and green technology. Could you explain some of the green technology that's going into this gymnasium? Well, not only the gymnasium, but the entire building will be foamed on the outside with three and a half inches of foam, uh, making the walls that you see here, the uh, concrete walls, warm walls with a brick veneer on the outside, which will be a cold wall. Uh, we're going to have a lot of glass in the building for solar gain, and there'll be uh, roof windows, uh, not uh, skylights, to allow for solar gain and the, uh, throughout the building. There'll be a central heat plant to make heat uh, for all three buildings, the Keene Middle School, the SAU building, and the Jonathan Daniels building. Hey, um, Bill, are we getting extra money from the state for making it a green building, uh, making it energy efficient? Yes, we are. We get an additional 3% uh, if we meet the CHIPS requirements, which is for a green building. And so that brings uh, the total donation from the state up to 58%. So by making it green, if we just round it off to $40 million, that's about $1.2 million in savings that's right. for the, the um, taxpayers of Keene. Over the cost of the bond, and then uh, that's also for interest. long term, long -term uh, gain in terms of efficiency as well. Is this going to be the total height of the building uh, for the gymnasium? Yes. These are finished walls. It's just waiting for roof rafters at the moment. Okay. So Bill, how many people would be able to use this gymnasium? It'll be a community uh, gym. So it'll be a community right. gym. So we're going to be, it's a community building. We're going to get as max use out of the community instead of just once the school closes, it's a dead building. Right. Not at all. The, uh, it's designed so that we can close off the academic areas and they can be secure at night and that will open up the auditorium, gymnasium, library, uh, cafeteria area for community activities. Okay. And the parking is also set up so that it's easy access at night into the, uh, into the common areas of the building. Okay, sorry about the noise, but this is a very active construction site. And could you explain to me how many stories? This is the classroom section of this, the project. That's correct. How many stories is this going to be? This is a two-story section. This is essentially all classrooms, and this is what we call the F, G, and H wing. Uh, the building's so large that it won't fit on a piece of paper, so we have had to do it in wings. Um, right now, all the first floor sections, we're on the grade level, uh, and it's going to go up from here. So it's going to go two stories? Correct. And so those, that rebob up there is where they're going to connect the second story? That's correct. Floor joists go in here, and then we'll start, once there's a concrete deck on there, we'll start going up from there. So in the future, we're going to... Hopefully soon we're going to have the steel beams going across. Yes, okay. this week. What are these, what are these rebar coming out of the ground the for? The rebar indicates where interior walls are, and that's the reinforcement for the interior wall. The concrete masonry units are all filled with grout and steel uh, for um, seismic, for any kind of seismic event. I was going to ask you that after the earthquake a couple of weeks ago, so this has to meet all the earthquake codes. Absolutely. So we want Absolutely. to ensure the kids are safe. Absolutely. Okay. Now, Bill, we're talking about that area over there to right. be an open green space. Yes. Then a number of people have concerns about they don't want to have the old middle school done and over. So what are we doing with the old middle school? Are we bringing any parts of the old middle school 
to this middle school to have a continuation of history? We have a, we have a group looking at what to do with all the awards and uh, commendations from over the years. Some will come here, some will go to the high school. We also have two very large rocks That's that it. sit outside of the school. Those rocks will, uh, will go to two different places. One rock will come here. It's been used traditionally for writing assignments. It has a hole in it. And uh, that will come here probably to the courtyard. The other rock is part of a uh, glacial uh, deposit left from Mount Escutney that was pushed down here by glaciers. That will be going to a new resting place at Keene State College uh, in, their, uh, in their science wing of their building. What about the World War, the World War II rock Which, or the memorial? Which one's that? Where's that going? Well, we're not sure yet. We're talking with the city about where, because we want their feedback as well on what will be the best place. Our architect knows that we want to bring these things down here, and so he's arranging for areas and recommendations on where they could go. What so, about, oh, excuse me, what about some of the, with the tree that overlooks the, that rock? Is that tree going someplace or is it staying with the it, sale? It's probably going to stay there uh, and will be replaced by new trees here. Okay. Because it, it's difficult to move a, a tree that size and be sure it's going to live. Okay, um, $36, $37 million is an awful lot of money. And if I'm just looking at this, this seems a pretty small place for $36, $37 million. So this just isn't the whole school, is it? No, this is the classroom wing, as we said, and behind us is the gymnasium. What remains is the auditorium on our, our right here. The uh, cafeteria is right behind me, the whole dining area. The administration area is off to my right. Uh, and the 37 million also includes the SAU building that we haven't even seen yet in the heat plant. So it's a very large structure. It's 161,000 square feet. So we have about a, a 900 seat auditorium that's going yes, over there. And so the gentleman was talking about that red dump truck, that's about where it's going to be that's the open. About the front entrance of the building as you come in into your administrative offices will be right over there. So it just so when we look at the, if we're trying to perceive what the final project is, it goes all the way. It follows that blue all the way around. That's Correct. all we're part right of the building. We're in the middle of it as you look around. And so it's a pretty huge project. Oh. And it's something that should last us for the next 40 to 50 years. Yes, sir. At least. It's probably the largest building project we've seen in probably 50 years. Okay. We were talking as we were walking up to the hill about some of the ADA um, things, upgrades that we put in this building. Could you tell us something about the elevator system? Yes, there are two elevators in the building. One is located in the classroom wing behind us, and the other one is uh, in the public space here by the auditorium. And then once anyone with any uh, disability is in the building, there are no ramps or um, restricted areas at all. Everything's on a flat surface. So we, we have an elevator in, in the school, the classroom, and then we have an elevator over there in the auditorium. Correct. So which means that no, every child that comes to this school will have complete access to every place in the school. And all community members coming for special events. So we want everyone to be able to come in and see their kids and their grandkids. And these elevators will enable everyone to get around the building. Unlike the old building that was on four or five different levels, access was very difficult for children. And we want to be sure that isn't an issue for all of our kids in the future. Okay, when we go back towards some environmental, we were talking about capturing the rainwater. Yes, the roof, the roof system has a drainage uh, system that encapsulates the water into the storage tanks so that the buildings and grounds people can use that for irrigation for the track and fields and uh, anything else that they want to water here. No water leaves the site. There's nothing going into our drain system here. I was a military engineer, and one of the biggest um, costs of my project was bringing in quality soil, because a lot of places they have clay, which bounces, it's not a good foundation. What have we done here for soil? Well, sir, the soil here is, is very well, is, is very good soil. It's sandy. The only thing we've had to do here is add processed stone to it to make it structurally sound. Uh, when it's compacted, it makes a 97% compaction rate, and it's perfectly suitable for the building. Okay, people go by and they see this big hump here, grass growing. What is that? That's the loam that was on top of the soil that was stripped off, and that's stockpiled right there, and that will be reused when they finish the building for grass and trees and landscape of all kind. Okay, and so you, we were talking about a ditch over there. You were, was that going to be water reclaiming? 
that you're talking about? Well, right, right here, there are about a half a dozen uh, water uh, cisterns, water quality devices on site that store water. As I said, the rainwater will be yep. uh, stored in these, and each one of them holds about 80% of the, uh, the is a uh, filter so that uh, as the water goes through it, 80% it, of the findings in it settles. Yep. And, it, and it goes through a series of those tanks until finally it's about clean water at the point of use. So that water should save us quite a bit of money because we all know that Keene has one of the highest water and sewage rate. And if you're pumping out the water, you're still paying for the sewage, even if it goes into the ground. Exactly. We're, we're capturing everything that's on the uh, parking lots and on the roof of the building for reuse. I know you were calling this the back 40, but before we go into the, the back 40, we were talking, some of these trees are 40, 50 years or, or older. Yes. And so there's going to be a lot of people who are going to say, why are we disturbing these trees? Are we wasting them? Are we making the use of the the trees that we're cutting down. This area is going to be for the fields, basically soccer fields, baseball fields, and the track for the school. To preserve the trees and to make the best use of it, what's behind us is a chipper. This is what we're going to be using for a heat source here is uh, chipped wood for our heat plant. And any good tree that's saleable for lumber is, is being sold. So what you're seeing here is pulp lumber being ground up into the truck to be shipped off somewhere else to be used as a fuel. And so, Bill, all these athletic fields, they're gonna be just like the other ones at the high school and stuff. We'll be able to rent them out to get income to up, upkeep the uh, athletic fields? Absolutely, we'll have a softball field, uh, track, full track that, that a high school team can compete on as well as a middle school. And then a soccer field in the middle. There'll be a concession stand. Uh, so that these, these, again, fields will be available for the community and the uh, wider good of the area. And from the archaeologist's point of view, we were talking about this is really kind of virgin soil that's been here for hundreds of, or even thousands of years. Thousands. Yes. And so, matter of fact, like you can smell the, the evergreen and you can smell the pine as they're going through them. <clears throat> so how long will it take us to clear this area? Well, the area that's cleared took 10 days ahead of us, which is about 22 acres at this point. Yes. There's another 20 acres here, so I imagine inside of a week's time, this will be down. So for management and efficiency and cost effectiveness, so you just bring in certain people, they do their project, and then they leave. So we control the, the workflow, we control the expenditure flow. That's correct. That's correct. And this is all in the scope of the work of the excavator. Okay, and that's part of your job is to ensure everything goes correct and on time. And meets the specifications. And meets the specifications. Yes, sir. So we have the, the city code enforcers. They come out and work with you and check to make sure everything's going along correctly? They do. They're here very often. Okay. So we have, um, we have equipment down there. We have, what's that? That's called the skitter, I think it is. is that the yes. Skitter? Yes. Yes. I should know that. My... Yes. Um, my son's grandkids, that's what he does. His father, their grandfather does lumbering. And what's going on here is a chipper operation. They're chipping any waste tree, any tree that doesn't qualify for lumber is getting chipped here, getting into the box truck, and will be sold as a fuel source. One other question. Okay, one of the problems, whether you're in California or in some of the other places, West Virginia, when you strip the trees, we worry about flooding. And we got water over there, and every once in a while, Keene has a lot of rain. What are we doing to protect us from, from flooding or bank sliding? There are swales that are in to direct and divert the water, and uh, the land is pitched. The fields are pitched to collect water in certain areas. Okay. And so fi finally over here, that building over there, that's the SAU building. Right. That's going to be real close to Jonathan Daniel. Yes. And, and so once that building is completed, then they'll complete the, they'll resurface and complete the road, repair the road to back at Jonathan. They, they've already started to work on that and uh, laying it out so for this new configuration for parking. There'll be a parking lot over here where the equipment is for the fields, and then I'll have, we'll have parking in the front for the SAU office. But the, they're configuring the road now, and uh, Bill will know better about what that road will be. Yeah, certainly in time for school. Not only that is, 
both of those fields are used quite often for t-ball and little league and all that and so the parents have a concern right. when they can get back there they'll be they'll have access also we've worked with the city to make sure that emergency vehicles have continuous access to the back of jonathan daniels should there be something going on there and so we, we talked about it earlier so what we're doing with the new power plant and the wood chip that will heat jonathan daniels it will heat all three buildings, and uh, except on the shoulder seasons when they rely on internal uh, furnaces to take the chill off in the morning. So when you're chill, the shoulder seasons, that's like October, November, right. um, March, right. April time where exactly. it could be 90 or it can be 30? Yep. Exactly. Cold morning, warm day. Okay, again for efficiency, energy saving, cost right. saving. Yes, sir. Okay, I don't know if you can get it. Right over there is a tractor trailer truck moving out with wood chips, and you stated that it was going to go to Portsmouth for what? It's going to go to Portsmouth. Public Service in New Hampshire has a processing plant there, and those will be used as fuel to make electricity. Because as, as a state rep, one of the things that we pushed, that we required a number of the public utilities to produce renewable energy. So what we're doing is that's not being wasted. It's going here, and probably in a couple of days, it could be powering someone's air conditioning. And so, these logs right over here, these are cash, no, excuse me, these are cash logs. That's right. So they'll, they'll be sold and we'll get money back for those to help. That's right, that's lumber. That's lumber. And so the machine, so we bring it down here. Here it is, it's cut up. They cut it in, why are they cutting in that length? That's a lumber length, that's a, probably a 12 foot length, make 12 foot or 16 foot boards. So that's standard for the double truck. That's right. right. Okay. That's right. And we were talking before, that's the SAU building that's going to be over there? Yes. Where the excavator is, is on the higher uh, part, the part of the building with no basement. The deeper basement is being backfilled as we speak. Then behind that is the power plant, the wood chip plant. So now if I put my school board hat on, yes, and it's, <clears throat> if everything works right, by the time that's built and you guys get ready to mill, move in, we'll already have a signed contract to sell 34 West Street. That's our goal. <laughs> okay, we, when I was on the school board before, that was one of the big things, we could get rid of 34 West Street. And, and I think it'll be very saleable once we, uh, we go out with the RFP. Because on 34 West Street, I remember again on last time, we spent a little, little bit of money to upgrade it because That's we didn't know if we were going to stay or not. So it's more energy efficient, so it should be more saleable. Correct. And when we, uh, when the bond passed, we made a conscious effort to cut back on uh, improvements and just do the maintenance things in order to, so that we're not investing more taxpayer dollars in a building that we're going to sell. So, and maybe a little luck, maybe the county will come and buy it. That would be great. That'll be the county complex, so that would be a win-win for the city and the county because King taxpayers pay an awful lot of money to the county. They do indeed. Well, that was a very interesting um, video. It's a very exciting project. And I was glad that we were able to do it, and I was glad that we had Bill, because a lot of people in Keene just don't have the opportunity to go to, to that construction site. Safety reasons and everything, they have to stand across the road if they're lucky, and they just see a lot of dirt and activity. It was 90-plus degrees that morning, too. So Warm day. I'm, I'm glad that we didn't come out soaking wet as we were in the shower. <laughs> But because of that 90, what do we do to um, keep protect the workers on there? Because the last thing we want to do is have some expensive accidents. We've, we've had one accident so far uh, involving when we were cutting uh, into the street in order to put in some conduits for cable. Uh, one man was injured uh, when a saw kicked back, and uh, he received stitches and should be back on the job site in about a week. Other than that, uh, there's, been some, uh, there's been no major incidents. Uh, McMillan has their own safety group that's on the site regularly checking. And as you notice, we were all wearing hard hats. And uh, they have a, a huge uh, endeavor to make sure that everyone's safe whenever they're on the site. We also, given that it's next to elementary school, uh, we have a process whereby every worker coming onto the site is given a background check and approved uh, through McMillan. And you would see on there the helmets of the fellows who are walking around on the project, a sticker with a number um, that's been assigned by McMillan 
to be sure that whoever is on that site is known to uh, the McMillan supervisors and, uh, and is okay to be there. And I'll go to the, one of the things that caused a lot of discontent and that was one of the big issues for a lot of parents concerning the principal shift or the consolidation. Mm -hmm. They were really concerned about who was going to be on that project so close to their children. I would be too if I had a child in, at Daniels. And um, <clears throat> another point one on the city council, we had a public hearing, um, a last full, full council concerning um, the changes in, in Maple Avenue. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are concerned because Maple Avenue used to be a nice quiet place, a nice forest. Now they could be looking at 900 plus kids and two, three, 400 vehicles in the morning. Yes, sir. Can you explain how the city and the um, school board is cooperating on alleviating some of those potential problems? Ever since the beginning of the project, uh, we've been working with city officials, uh, their engineers and planners, to be sure that whatever we do to the site is not ne negatively going to impact uh, the, the quality of uh, living and particularly the traffic situation. Uh, we've worked with the state as well to move our driveway so that they're in a place that has the best visibility uh, for cars coming in and going out. Uh, we've, uh, we have engineers that work through our architect as well as working with the city engineers to be sure that uh, traffic calming uh, things will be put in to slow traffic down and direct it. There'll be, a, there'll be travel lanes as well as lanes so that cars can pull into the driveway without impeding traffic. Uh, we're working with the city on a grant called uh, for sidewalks for kids to go back and forth to school that will make that area safer and uh, will give a chance for children who want to ride their bikes to school, make a safer environment for them and for people who want to walk. And kind of one of the neat things about the location is that it's not far from the new YMCA. So that we're hoping that a lot of our students will take the opportunity after school to travel on up to the Y and, and take part in their activities as well. Uh, we're looking at the intersection with the uh, off-ramp from Route 12 going north. There'll be some work done on that intersection to make, it, to make traffic flow more smoothly in both directions. Uh, because now at, at certain times, it's a bottleneck now, it is, given yeah. the industrial park on the other side there. So we're working with the city to improve that intersection and also to make some improvements so we don't back up our school buses over by, I believe it's a 7-Eleven, on, on the other side of the site so that, so that we won't be backing up traffic going into 12A or turning left onto Maple Ave. So both parts of Maple Avenue will undersee, undergo construction to ensure. Correct. Because one of the problems I've heard people talking about is, for example, at certain school days, you just don't go downtown because you have parent after parent car just backed up, basically shutting down downtown. Right. I think an advantage to the new site is that parents will be able to come off of Maple Ave to pick up their children. So we're not going to impede the flow of traffic when, when cars are stopped, either uh, letting kids out or, or putting them back in the car at the end of the day. So all the buses and all the cars will be on our site uh, at the times when traffic is flowing back and forth. We we're talking about the, the North 40 cutting down all those trees. Are we going to be cutting down the trees along Route 12 or are they going to stay in place? I believe we've had a cut. Our original plan on clearing that beginning 20 acres was that any tree left in that area would stay. Uh, we've had some issues with a couple of trees that due to high winds or some of the construction equipment, a couple of those trees have been injured and we decided to take those down. Uh, otherwise, all the trees that are on the site will stay. Because if you go around different places around the country, when you build um, a school next to a highway, you have a lot of noise coming off the highway. I don't think we need to build a barrier wall because if we keep right. the trees there, the, cr the trees are noise reducing. It's, it's true, and I think that, that section will remain along the, the fence on that side closest to 12. And it not only makes the site seem prettier, um, and directs people's attention towards the fields and all, but it also shields the sound. When we're, we're talking about the, the upgrades, the new ball, the ball fields, the new athletic fields, another big issue, the amount of money we're, we're spending out of surplus to upgrade um, alumni field. Mm -hmm. I've heard over and over again, 
team cannot bring a lot of state events because we just don't have the quality of the athletic facilities. Say if we wanted the state track meet or we wanted to have some of the big Special Olympic events and some of those because we just don't have the availability. Will we have that availability with the middle school? The, an issue is for uh, that the way I farm our athletic director is the concern about light and that during, the, during major events that are bringing either regional or across the state athletes in to compete, they're worried about it getting too dark to compete. And uh, no one wants to judge the javelin in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want to be a javelin catcher. And so uh, we've been, uh, we've, we haven't been able, eligible to hold those events because uh, we don't have the lighting. So with the work that's being done, and a lot of it's being done through volunteer help at, uh, at Alumni Field, that'll give us the ability to, to hold those events and compete against other venues like Exeter and Nashua uh, for, uh, for those kinds of events. The um, s switching gears, one, one of the big things that, that's going around the country, for example, in Massachusetts, the girl that was bullied online yes, and committed suicide, the, the one outside, I think in Missouri, the, the mother created a, a false face page and the girl committed suicide. So there's a number of laws going to affect conserving what's called cyberbullying. Right. And so New Hampshire has just passed one. So how is that going to affect um, the computer and internet access in this? Well, if I could take a step back for a second for viewers my age <laughs> and older, uh, because cyberbullying <clears throat> wasn't an issue when we were kids in school. Uh, cyberbullying has is, is, uh, evolved as children have become better able to use the internet and to text message on their phones and to, uh, and to use email. And what it is basically is uh, children being identified and taunted and teased by classmates or, f or friends from home uh, d through, the, through those means, through the internet. And, uh, and it has had a devastating effect on children's lives. And you identify two of the most tragic cases. The one involving uh, the young woman down in Massachusetts in particular, I think, really hit our area hardest because of the proximity. Why was she about six, 14 or 16 years old? She was recently uh, come to the United States from Ireland. Uh, I believe she was a freshman or a sophomore, or going into, so 14, she would have 15. gone into her sophomore year. And, uh, and so I think an issue for, a concern for us is that parents really don't know how to help their children work through these issues because it's, it's really a new form of communication. And the way it uh, messages travel is just incredibly fast. And as a school district, we feel like we're trying to catch up because this information can go from one child to the entire school in a matter of seconds or minutes. The, um, the other part is, okay, we, we want to protect our children. We want right. to do everything possible to check, protect our children. But where does the school's responsibility legally end and where does the parent's responsibility both morally and legally begin? Uh, those lines are getting more and more blurred. Uh, back, as I said, when, when we were children, uh, you know, the, the responsibility of the school ended at the school door. And when you walked out that door and something happened on the way home, that was really your family's issue um, or the, the police department if it was a, a serious incident. Now those lines have blurred. We have children in school that have text phones. Uh, that, I don't think access. that's the right term, but they have access to, to the internet, right internet the and we have an internet policy in place for use of our school computers. And children should have their own password on, on those machines, and, uh, and it should be clearly communicated who's sending the message and, and, you know, and where it's intended to go. That, that was one of my big questions. If, if I have a computer at home and my daughters are on it, my grandchildren are on it, my wife's on it, and one, one of us send it, who's is it? How do we know who sent it? Who's going to be held That's responsible? Right. We don't. And we had a, a, a situation at Keene High School um, last spring, and, uh, and police were involved, and it involved a threat uh, that was made over the Internet. And as a school district, we weren't able to really act on that until the police were able to identify uh, the email address and go and talk with that family. Uh, and that took uh, much more time than it actually took the message to spread throughout the high school community. 
And so we feel like we're always playing catch up when it comes to uh, messages that may go out. We're very fortunate at Keene High, as you know, we've had two school resource officers since we instituted that program about four years ago. Both of them are pretty computer savvy and are able to go on to the social networking sites and are able to, uh, to help children that come in and say, I feel I'm being bullied or harassed uh, through my emails or, or through text messages. And so we've, I think, had a bit of an advantage over some of our other school districts in that we had people on board that had access to, uh, to these sites that a lot of folks, as I say, like myself, really don't know how to get into. My children won't show me how to get on Facebook. <laughs> Maybe they don't want to see what they're putting on Facebook. <laughs> well, when, um, yeah, we talk about cyberbullying, but you brought up the point on Facebook. I don't think a lot of students understand some of the negative consequences and the long-term consequences mm -hmm. of putting a lot of things on Facebook. I, like we were talking about earlier, students can have in, internet access through their phone and I can see them both at the college and they're just making updates and they're not even thinking. That's correct. And basically kind of like whatever you put on the internet, it never disappears. There's nope. no eraser. And you really should assume that everybody's going to read it, including your parents. And uh, it's not like the old days where if you wrote someone a letter and expressed your anger, uh, that letter, you could go back to the person and say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I, you know, I was having a bad day. Would you give me that letter back or please destroy it? And that would be the end of the issue. Today, that note or letter or picture will go on and on and on and on all through the world. Well, so you brought up the point, the picture. Okay, now we come to sexing. Yes. And sexing is someone taking a picture of themselves, an inappropriate picture of themselves, texting it to someone else, and they think they're just doing it. And we've had cases around the country where it's gone viral, and like I said, in a matter of minutes. Right, and it's not just pictures of themselves. It's not just pictures uh, of the. Of so themselves. that you may be unaware uh, that there are, could be potentially embarrassing pictures uh, floating out there. And, um, you know, we do as a regular part of our hiring, uh, we will, if they have, uh, we, our uh, HR department will, will follow up on, on people electronically. And, you know, we found uh, people who are, are saying things on their web pages or on their Facebook uh, page that could potentially be embarrassing to our school district. Uh, my own son, who is of legal age, had a picture on his Facebook of he and a couple friends um, having a beer at a campfire. Unfortunately, he was working as a camp counselor at the time. Not a good idea. Not a great idea. And the camp director called and said, either take that picture down or... Or, or you're going you're gonna to have to quit because uh, parents and other kids will go and look. And that's a fairly mild example of, you know, a, a legal activity for someone his age that could have a, you know, a, a poor reflection on an institution or on he himself when he goes to look for a full-time job. Because there's, there's, when it comes to sexing, there's a number of um, communities where the prosecutors are trying to prosecute students 15, 16, 17 years old for possession of child pornography. And if they get convicted, they become a lifelong sex offender. And in a lot of cases, their life is destroyed yep. over something they thought was innocent and it was just a, a joke. And something that is, in my mind, perhaps more sinister are the adults who prey upon children on the Internet. And Keene is incredibly fortunate to have Jim McLaughlin um, as, as a detective on our police force. And... Uh, and he, uh, you know, he's aware of, of what people with, that are unscrupulous can do to manipulate younger, particularly uh, you know, preteen kids, into behaviors that could potentially be very, very dangerous for them. And these people are out there, and they're cruising through chat rooms. Uh, to be honest, I've never been on a <laughs> chat room. Uh, but to, so I don't really know how the mechanism works, but they're pretending to be uh, young people, and they're, they're people our age that are out there hoping to uh, take advantage of, of young people. And I think to take that full cycle, it goes back to what you, were, uh, you mentioned about the importance of parental supervision. Uh, uh, in when, uh, when we first set up a computer in our house, it was in a place where my wife and I walked by all the time. And, you know, you could glance over and, and see what was on the screen when the children were there. And it's certainly not foolproof. But, uh, but they didn't have a computer of their own. They had to share one 
that my wife and I use. And, and, uh, and I think sometimes as they got older, we let them have a computer in their room. But by then they were 18, 19 years old and able to make uh, better and more mature decisions about who they chose to talk with online or what websites to go to. When my grandson, he's, he's going to be nine years old this Cute little week, guy. And he wants a DSi. And there's a lot of the old DSs, but now it's DSi yep. that a lot of eight, nine, ten year old kids have. But the DSi has complete internet access. Mm -hmm. So we could, without parent supervision, without setting down some ground rules, we could have eight, nine, ten year old kids accessing the wrong websites and getting Correct. themselves in trouble. And our rules say they may have to be suspended or expelled based on how bad it is. Yep. And I don't think a lot of parents are, are realizing that. So something as innocent as an eight or a nine year old kid could end up in some serious trouble. Absolutely. And uh, those are things that if people a little older, as you mentioned, we are now getting into serious trouble over. The Keene School Board has taken a particular interest in cyberbullying. And uh, we, we had planned to have a forum for parents to come in this spring. But uh, by the time we went to schedule it, with all the events going on at the Keene High Auditorium, uh, because the closure of the middle school auditorium in particular, we weren't able to schedule it. But we're planning on having that forum in the fall where parents can come in and learn more about cyberbullying and to express concerns that they may have about situations that their children have been in. And, and begin a dialogue among uh, all the parents of our schools to talk about how best to address cyberbullying. And a lot of the research points to the importance of how the school culture and how the children in the school can work together to address problems around cyberbullying. And that will be an initiative for us going forward in the next school year. Uh, and I have one last question for you. We you were talking about the the new Y being built by the, the middle school, the yes. new middle school. We, the Keene School District has had a long relationship with the, the present Y Absolutely. and the middle school yes. as far as our wellness programs mm -hmm. and athletic programs because I don't see any place for middle school kids to do any exercise during the winter months. No, as you know, there, was a ton, there, wasn't a, <laughs> there was a bridge, uh, a, literally a bridge <laughs> between the middle school and, and the Y. And given the cramped facilities we had at Keene Middle School, it was wonderful of the Y to open up their exercise areas for our students during the day uh, so that we, they could go over and, and engage in activities uh, when, in their physical education periods. But in the new building, we're going to have adequate space so that we're not going to be looking at uh, arrangements that will go on during the school day. But there's a world of activities going on at the Y after school. And our goal is to get at least make the children aware and get as many of them up there for the swimming and the other activities that we won't be offering at King Middle School through our intramural program and wellness programs, which are, are a huge part of the school now. I'm glad you said intramural program. Yeah, I've been an athlete, but I think in, in the school system, the most beneficial, most cost effective is a well quality, well run intramural program. Self esteem, wellness, Absolutely. the whole works. And, and uh, I know you were an outstanding athlete, and I loved athletics too, but I wasn't an outstanding <laughs> athlete. And if it wasn't for intramural programs, I would not have had the opportunity to compete um, in as many sports as, as I loved. And, you know, you and I grew up under, under roughly similar conditions where it wasn't the best place to be out on the streets in our neighborhoods. And without those athletic programs, uh, my life could be dramatically different than it is today. It's, when you talk about outstanding athlete, I didn't make velocity until I was a senior. Most mm -hmm. of all my other years was in intramural. Uh, you had to, to work it up. If I didn't have an intramural program, I would have never made the varsity. So yeah. it, to me, it's really important. The, um, I want to thank you for, for being on the show. It was a pleasure being show, here, sir. Our first one. And best of luck with your show. Thank you. And I just want to let the, um, the public know if they have any questions about whatever, anything we talked or even what we didn't talk about, email us or blog, bloggers. The names or the in there. Um, yep. The addresses will be up there for everyone to get at. And um, we will answer them as quick as possible. I will get with Bill to answer them. I may have Bill back to answer some of the questions 
or we may just answer them through the blog or send right back on email. I would love to come back. Uh, the Department of Ed, in response to the new legislation on cyberbullying, is holding a, uh, workshops next month, and I'll be attending those, and I'll be coming back with much more uh, detailed information than we have now. Well, so I'll I would back. be more than happy to come but back. I think that's a really an important thing to prevent our kids from getting into trouble. And I agree. And I'd love to give you another tour of the middle school um, in a few weeks when there's more to those walls than just the center. I will appreciate that. Excellent. Okay. And so <clears throat> now we're going to go to what will end up being another session part, segment of our show is getting to the rest of the truth. Today's session will be on um, Veterans Affairs. And first thing is we're going to talk about people think, well, all veterans can go to the VA. And that's always been they've been promised um, veteran service. Well, the answer is yes and no. The VA was formed for wartime veterans who had had injuries and or pensioners. You never wanted to be a pensioner. That was wartime and you didn't make the, the poverty level. Up until 1996, that's all the VA, VA was about. Service-connected wartime veterans. 1996, the, the law was changed, which basically went from um, service-connected to basically providing services for disabled and both low-income veterans. And because of that, the only people who are guaranteed medical service is Category 1 and Category 2. The poorer veterans now have to meet um, a financial requirement to be able to get services, and the services are on um, a case-by-case, case, um, <laughs> case by, I'm getting down with this, <laughs> a case-by-case case based on um, availability. And so people think, I gotta bring grandpa up there, and then you find out, well, sorry, grandpa makes, not, makes too much money, and he can't be um, treated. So one part of it is knowing the rules of the game so you really don't get frustrated. Um, the second part of the change in 1996 is that in a lot of cases you have to pay for VA medical services. I'm 100% because I've got banged up quite a bit in the military, but mostly all my damage is on the left side. I went up to the VA earlier this year and I had right side problems. And because my wife had insurance, her insurance got billed $1,800. And people go, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Well, the VA only takes care of service-connected disabilities. People go, well, whole body. It, nope, it's not the body. If you've got a bum knee and your ankle hurts and your wife has or your spouse has insurance, her insurance is going to pay for your bum ankle, not the knee. And so that confuses a lot of people. The other part, we just had um, a number of congressmen coming out and say, oh, yeah, we went from 11. In 30 years for the first change, we went mileage from 11 to 28 to 41 cents per mile. Well, last year when it went to 28 cents, well, there was a little catch. When it went to all the funding for the mileage came out of medical services. So every time someone got a dollar for a mile mileage, that means there was one dollar less for medical services, and so it wasn't really fair. Congress then brought it up to 41, but they funded that. But there's, again, caveat. If you're 30% or higher and you go into the VA, you get mileage. If you're less than 30%, again, if you're going for your bum knee, you get mileage. If you're going for any other thing, you don't get mileage. And people, again, wait a minute, doesn't make sense. I'm not judging whether it's right or wrong, but again, I think it's really important to people to understand if you're not going to get mileage and you got to go up to White River Junction, you may decide, wait a minute, it's going to cost me too much money, so let's call the DAV so I can get a free ride. Let's call the Red Cross so I can get, get a free ride. Again, it's providing the correct information. The other part, when we talk about disabilities, well, the VA has a glass type of um, process. If you, your first disability is 50%, you're 50%. That's in your um, working capacity. Then you get another disability at 50%. It's not 100% because once the VA gave you a disability of 50%, you're only half a glass full of water. And so if it says, well, you have another disability of 50%, 
they take a qu half of that half, so they take a quarter, so now you're 75. And all of a sudden, Lord forbid, you get another 50%, it's only 12 and a half because that's half of the quarter. And so again, that frustrates people because you may have three, four, five disabilities and add up to 200%, um, percent, and you may say, well, you're only 70% disabled. And, and VA goes, wait a minute, it doesn't really make you go, it doesn't make sense. The other part is the, the compensation. The VA doesn't really pay very much when you um, have um, conversation. And I'm going to say I got the numbers right over here. If you have 70% disability and you are married with a child, and 70% is you're, you're pretty hot, you're pretty bad off. You only get paid $1,400 a month. And in Keene, some places, you may end up paying rent and utilities is more than $1,400 a month. And yes, we have a number of veteran-friendly um, companies, but who's going to hire a veteran who has 70% disability that may have to make 15 to 20 trips up to White River Junction, which means he or she can't work for that day? So you're going to be very menial, meaningless, menial j jobs or you better be a professional where you can afford to, to take those times off. <clears throat> Again, not right or wrong, but those are some, there's a lot of misconceptions about VA services. They do provide services for a lot of people, but what I think what frustrates a lot of them, people get bits and pieces of the information. They go up there and they say, this is what I deserve, this is what I rate, and the people, the VA breaks out the rule book and the rule says, this is the other rules. So again, I, we're short on time, but the idea is I want to get people out there is well, you got to learn the rules. If you don't learn the rules, you're going to be frustrated. And so if you have any concerns about or questions about some of the VA <clears throat> stuff, email me, ask me some questions. We'll try to get some people back from, on from the VA, some of the other organizations that help veterans. But the goal is, is to provide you the information so you can make the decision that's best for you. And that, that, that gets scary at times because when you're hurting, um, you know, it's on air, but I shouldn't say it on air. But when I was helping people with the DAV, getting rides or um, helping veterans, if you, ha if you have a medical emergency and you go to the emergency room, I used to tell them, Tell them you're thinking you have a heart attack or tell them you think you're having a stroke because if you get a $2,000 bill, the VA pays for it. If you break a leg with a compound fracture and you go, go to the emergency room, it doesn't matter if you're a veteran. That is your bill. And a lot of people think because they're a veteran and they have a major accident or emergency that the VA is going to pay for it. Nope, basically all the VA really pays for if you have a stroke or if you're having a heart attack. So if you have a compound fracture and your chest is really tight and you go in, say, you know, my chest is tight and I got chest pains, and oh yeah, by the way, I have a compound fracture, then it's taken care of. It shouldn't be that way, but again, people have made some decisions that have resulted in really expensive um, medical payments that they um, shouldn't have to. So what we're going to do now is, again, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I hope I didn't bore you. I hope I provided some information for the general public. That is our goal, is to provide much as much information as possible. Our guest next week will be the Bendels, who from Anadnock Air. They had put on the air show, so we'll have some exciting footage from the air show, and we'll, we'll talk about that. The, my other, um, let's get down to the rules, the whole truth, will be on some economics um, one. How do we lose 125 jobs and unemployment goes from 9.7 to 9.5? How are we, quote, unquote, out of a recession when um, things don't seem right? Why is businesses making such a great profit when they're hiring less people? Again, we all get part of the truth, but we just don't always understand. So if you have some questions about economic issues, email me, and I'll put them in the show, and we'll go from there. And so as we go again, we'll try to get as much clarity as possible. And as I've always taught was, you never get in trouble for knowing too little. You always get in trouble for knowing too much. So I would like us to get as much trouble as possible because we're doing our job. 
So again, I just want to thank everybody, and hopefully, again, I didn't waste your time, and that's not my intention. Thank you. Refreshments provided by Gehausen Distributors. Premium beverages delivered.